All right, well, here we go with our final seventh lecture on attention. Um, today we're going to be talking about the neuropsychology uh, of attention. Specifically, we're going to look at um, Posner's attentional networks, talk a little bit about ADHD and some gender differences in attention. We'll talk about mindfulness as a potential way to treat attention problems. And then we'll finish up by looking at how uh, different drugs affect attention, you know, which uh, students find uh, generally fairly interesting. So let's start with uh, talking about Posner's theories of uh, attention. Uh, Posner proposed three different attentional uh, systems, a subcortical system, which is also known as the alerting system. This is the uh, part of our attention system uh, devoted to sort of general levels of arousal and alerting. It's really the most primitive system uh, in that it's involved in things like alerting us for danger um, and uh, automatically capturing our attention. The posterior system then is also known as the orienting system and this is uh, involved in direction of attention in space. So this is how we um, visually orient to a specific location, um, specifically pay attention to specific locations, and this is based on sensory information. And then finally we have an anterior system uh, which is based in the frontal lobes, which is the executive control network. Uh, and its job is to sta sustain our attention to objects or events, so to focus our attention, keep it sustained to one place, uh, select information based on abstract information, so for example, selecting based on meaning, um, and also to switch among tasks, so some switch from one task to the other, or switch from paying attention to one thing or the other. So these are the three networks that Posner proposed, and there's a great deal of evidence um, supporting this, and there's a great um, task that tests these three networks called the Attentional Network Tasks, or the ANT. So let's start by looking at the subcortical system. As I said, this is also known as the alerting system. Um, some tasks used to test the alerting system include uh, vigilance tasks, which test tonic alerting, um, so just sort of our basic level of alert. Uh, and then cueing tasks, so those that involve some sort of warning, um, test our phasic alerting. So if we get some sort of warning that a stimulus is um, coming up, that uh, involves our phasic alerting, so what, uh, how we're paying attention uh, specifically. So the locus corollius, never pronounce that right, is activated following a warning signal, so this is part of that alerting system. Um, drugs that block norepinephrine will decrease alerting, while drugs that increase norepinephrine will increase a warning signal. This is something that's really important to understand about norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is released uh, by a sympathetic nervous system response, so whenever we have um, a danger signal or an alert signal, we usually get an increase in norepinephrine. There are also drugs that cause releases of norepinephrine, so drugs like amphetamines and methamphetamine um, cause pretty substantial norepinephrine releases. These will cause an increase in alerting and will increase warning signals, which is why people will become very alert and oftentimes very paranoid because um, their sort of alerting system is constantly on alert and constantly looking for uh, things. Uh, the right hemisphere appears to be involved in sort of slower tonic alerting, so just sort of our basic vigilance, paying attention but not alerted um, level, while the left hemisphere uh, is involved in more rapid, what we call phasic alerting, so it changes us from this background level of alert to a um, new phasic alerting. So if we look at um, the alerting system, uh, the, lo the locus corollis projections of the alerting system here are shown in a macaque brain. Um, they interact with other more strongly localized systems, but include certainly regions of the frontal and parietal cortex, but you can see this reaches up from the subcortical systems uh, throughout uh, the cortex. Uh, this is generally how we think of um, the alerting system as working, as coming from the subcortical systems and uh, working upwards. Uh, to affect our attention, so they can affect the other systems as well. The orienting, orienting system then is focused on the ability to prioritize sensory information by selecting a location or modality. And so we've actually taken a look at the task that's primarily used in this, the Posner queuing task. And the version I uh, present here is one from some of my research. It's a little different from the original Posner queuing task, uh, but it's certainly uh, similar enough for our discussion. So uh, as we talked previously, uh, in the Posner queuing task, you have valid trials, so you get um, a signal here on the left indicating 
a location, you direct your attention to that location, and the target appears there. Uh, in this particular task uh, that I used, uh, this appeared on 80% of the trials. Uh, that is, the Q 80% of the time was predictive of the location of the target, and the participant's uh, job was simply to press a key as soon as they saw that target, that little asterisk down there in the bottom box. In an invalid trial, the key would indicate a location, but the target would appear somewhere else. And so on 20% of queued trials, uh, this is what would occur. What happens is people direct their attention to where that uh, queue has indicated for them to look, uh, but the target appears somewhere else, and it takes longer for them to detect that target than it does in the um, valid trials where the queue is a valid indicator of the location. We also had neutral trials where there was no... Um, indication of where the target might appear. So in these tasks, <coughs> um, we measure what's called the validity effect, where we take the invalid reaction time and subtract out the valid reaction time. So what that does is it tells us the cost, the cost in time of uh, getting that invalid queue. So how long it takes you to move from that invalid queued location to the valid location is called the validity effect. There is evidence from a variety of sources that those non-queued locations are actively inhibited um, in these kinds of tasks. And in some of my research, we show that women show larger validity effects. If we take a look at that data, on the left we have uh, males and on the right we have females, and this is from two different experiments. And what you can see is that uh, reaction times are a little longer for females, and that's generally consistent with what we see across the literature. But if you look at the um, circles versus triangles and the distance between those, um, what you can see is uh, the women are having much longer reaction times for their invalid locations compared to the valid locations um, compared to males. And in fact, males show faster reaction times to the invalid queues compared to uh, control trials with no queue, whereas women um, are showing very similar reaction times. Now, we don't make any conclusions about exactly what's happening, but it's entirely possible uh, that the reason we get these results is that women are better at inhibiting those non queued locations, so they're actually better at focusing their attention in one place, and that's what the cost uh, increases the cost to them because they've actually done a better job of inhibiting those non queued locations. Um, but the exact nature of that finding um, is under investigation by a number of people. So the neuroanatomy of the alerting system, uh, this is a more dorsal system, including the frontal eye fields and the interparietal sulcus, or the IPS. Um, we see that breaking the focus of attention in an invalid trial, so moving from that cued location to where the actual um, target is, involves the temporal parietal junction. Um, and we'll see, of course, that uh, the effects of hemispatial neglect are also there right at the um, inferior parietal lobule, which is right there at that in interparietal sulcus. Um, we've actually seen research that shows that anticholinergic drugs, um, so um, blocking acetylcholine injected into the parietal lobes, have significant effects on our ability to shift attention. So this is certainly um, part of, so here we have the frontal eye fields, uh, the inferior to parietal sulcus, here's the inferior to parietal lobule, um, the temporal parietal junction. So this uh, injection of anticholinergic drugs into this area uh, ends up with an inability to uh, shift tension from one location to another. So some converging evidence that uh, this system certainly involved in orienting us to different locations. Um, we certainly think that the temporal parietal junction has been associated with perspective taking, uh, in particular thinking about the intentions of others and the consequences of others. So um, we often talk about this as reversing the gaze, that is your ability to see somebody else's perspective. So what does it look like from their perspective? Um, and that temporal parietal junction has been associated with that kind of attentional shift. So lots of evidence that uh, this is uh, a system involved in orienting, orienting us to specific views or um, places. So finally, in Posner's theory, we have the executive control network. Uh, this includes a frontal parietal network, uh, the cingulo 
cingular opercular network, which is rather difficult to say, uh, which we'll talk about those two, and then we'll talk about deficits and executive control and how those are seen. I first want to introduce you to some executive control tasks. Um, we've talked about the flanker task and stroop task, so up in the right is the flanker task from uh, the attentional network task. So here, remember in the version, version I showed you in previous lectures, it was letters that people were looking for here. Um, we're looking for uh, specific arrows. So here we have uh, congruent trials, incongruent trials, and neutral trials. And again, these flankers change um, the amount of time it takes to identify uh, this particular uh, target we're looking for. Uh, the Stroop task we've talked about, of course, already involves inhibiting uh, the word while focusing on the color. But finally, I'm going to introduce a new player to this field, which is the Wisconsin card sorting task. And the Wisconsin card sorting task, um, what we see is um, a pretty interesting phenomenon. And I, and I know this isn't necessarily used as often as it used to be for actual neuropsychological assessment. But um, the way it affects executive functioning is really important in terms of uh, our description today. So I think it's important to talk about. So this uh, is essentially what happens. Uh, the person who's giving the test lays out these four exemplar cards, and the um, participant, the person who's taking the task, their job is to sort this um, card onto the appropriate pile. So uh, there are several different ways in which this can be sorted. It can be sorted based on shape, in which case it should go here, based on color, in which case it should go here, or based on number of objects, in which case it should go here. Um, so uh, the way this works is the person taking the test has to hypothesis test. And they have to remember what's happened from the previous trial and use that information on a subsequent trial. So uh, once they've figured that out, at some point, the person giving uh, the exam will switch aspects. That is, what the person is supposed to be sorting on. So let's say they were sorting previously based on shape. And so they dutifully place their card here, and the um, person giving the test says no. Well, a person with normal executive functioning um, will move on, um, whereas somebody who does not have executive functioning will keep trying to sort based on shape. We call that a perseverative error. And we'll talk more about this here in just a bit. So the executive control network includes the frontal parietal network, um, which is laid out in yellow here versus the singular opercular system which is set out in black, and so there's lots of different parts in this. We're going to focus primarily on the functional aspects of this and some of the important areas, so don't memorize this um, brain network here. Uh, the frontal parietal network is associated with starting and stopping a task, so we talked about task switching. Remember, starting a task and stopping a task is part of that. Moment-to-moment uh, -moment monitoring of tasks, so a little bit of vigilance, paying attention to a task, uh, resolving conflicts, so things like Stroop task. Uh, and task switching, so switching from one thing to the other. All of this is done with the frontal parietal network. Um, so all this is particularly important. And we'll talk about how individuals with head injuries oftentimes have difficulty with some of these tasks. Uh, the cingular opercular network uh, is primarily in the anterior cingulate, uh, and this is involved in, in maintaining ongoing task performance. Um, so keeping uh, an ongoing task going, keeping you on task, um, monitoring intentions, etc. Uh, and so this is involved in that sort of ongoing task performance. And that's, um, again, here in the sort of black areas, anterior prefrontal cortex uh, and anterior cingulate. Uh, individuals with damage to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, so let's go back here a bit. Um, this area here on the side is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or the DLPFC. Um, which just rolls right off the tongue, um, is particularly important in um, executive control. So individuals with damage to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex often have executive functioning problems. And uh, unfortunately, this is an area of the brain that is susceptible to injury, particularly um, for things like car accidents, um, concussions, head injuries, um, that sort of thing. So football injuries, hockey injuries, uh, bull riding, really terrible on the DLPFC, um, car accidents, as I said, and other accident, uh, other um, causes of uh, traumatic brain injury like um, war injuries from uh, proximity to explosive explosions. These are all 
ways in which the DLPFC can be damaged. In particular, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex lesions uh, will result in perseverative errors on the Wisconsin card sorting task. And so they're unable to um, move on from the thing that they've been trying, so they keep trying it over and over and over again, uh, which can be particularly frustrating. So again, back to this Wisconsin card sorting task, um, essentially what's ha what happens is, so let's say in this case they were sorting based on number, they try to place the card with the triangles in this case because they're matching up numbers, um, yet they've been told on previous trials um, that that's to, that no, that's not correct when they've sorted based on number of objects, um, and they still keep trying that over and over again. So we'll talk more about um, executive functioning in working memory, um, because the central executive is also part of the model of working memory, and then we will spend um, a lot more time talking about head injury and um, its consequences. Cause it's a really important part of of looking at. A difficulty with executive functioning. Uh, for now, I want to move on and talk about uh, some other areas of attention. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder um, is certainly something we hear a lot about. Um, there's also obviously a lot of controversy about uh, the number of people uh, diagnosed with this disorder. For me, I think the attention deficit disorder is the important part of that. Um, people who aren't able to sustain their attention for long periods of time. I think with kids, the problem is um, we expect them to sustain their attention longer than they ought to be able to at that age. They need more recess, they need more time to get out and run around. Um, but that's uh, another problem for another day. <coughs> Excuse me. A genuine attention deficit disorder appears to be related to dopamine pathways from subcortical structures to the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes exhibit um, control, top-down control over those subcortical structures, um, and so some disruption in that pathway can result in um, attentional difficulties. Treatment with methylphenidate uh, does alleviate those symptoms, and methylphenidate is, an, is a stimulant. And people have always wondered why stimulants can treat attention deficit disorder. Well, it's because it increases that top-down inhibition um, that increases activity and therefore increases those inhibitory processes we've been talking about. So it allows the frontal lobes to exert their control uh, to a greater extent uh, from the top down. Um, and that's why uh, drugs like um, methylphenidate and um, Adderall, which is amphetamine, um, are able to exert that top-down control in people with attention deficit disorder. People who don't have ADD will oftentimes get real squirrel-like on these drugs because they're just simply um, too hyper. They've, yeah, they're basically high instead of getting, treating their attention deficit disorder. <coughs> I do want to stop for a minute and talk a little bit about gender and attention. Um, I introduced a little bit of my research on uh, this topic uh, under the orienting network. Um, we also know, however, that males in general uh, have larger right hemispheres. Females tend to have larger left hemispheres in general, not everyone. Uh, males are more than twice as likely to be diagnosed with ADHD, up to four times as likely. Um, and we've also seen research that testosterone affects the dopamine pathways, and this has been shown to affect attention. So it's possible that testosterone is acting on attention in ways that may be particularly important for us to think about. There are certainly some ways in which we'll see uh, gender, gender differences sorry, in visual spatial ability um, versus verbal ability because of that left-right hemisphere uh, distinction. So it's something to keep in mind. That there's certainly some evidence for um, issues with gender and sex and attention. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I was going to talk a little bit about ways in which to treat uh, attention problems. And one of the uh, emerging um, stars in this area is mindfulness training um, or integrated mind-body therapy. So basically what I'm going to take you through is some evidence showing that integrated mind-body training, which is a form of meditation, can improve executive control over attention. Uh, and this is a great study um, uh, by Tang et al. And Mike Posner was part of this um, research. Uh, groups randomly assigned to five days of mindfulness training versus just basic relaxation therapy. 
Uh, and you hear a lot about mindfulness now. This is part of where this came from. Lots of questions about what uh, really is involved with mindful, mindfulness, what exactly is mindfulness. Uh, we don't have time to get into all of those issues, but look into it because there are lots of benefits to it. So we're going to take a look at the data now. The first we see is uh, improved reaction times for executive control. So um, we have the control group, which is the relaxation, versus the uh, green group, which is the people who got mindfulness training. And as you can see in the conflict trials, um, which is the flanker task, uh, which involves executive control, we can see um, reduced reaction times in the mindfulness training group, indicating that they're able to overcome that conflict uh, more easily. Uh, in the profile of mood states, we actually see improvements in mood in a variety of places. So um, improvements in reductions in anger and hostility, um, reductions in depression, dejection, fatigue and inertia, reductions in tension and anxiety, and increases in vigor and activity. So there is evidence that these mindfulness activities also improve mood. Um, the other great part about this is the uh, mindfulness group showed uh, reduced cortisol release um, if they were given some sort of mental stress. So here we have uh, on the left baseline before stress, um, still even a little bit lower cortisol levels in the experimental group that got the mindfulness training. After they were given um, some sort of mental stress challenging task, we see um, the uh, experimental group that got the mind, uh, mindfulness training, much lower levels of cortisol compared to the control group. And then after getting some additional training, uh, again, we see really significant reductions uh, of cortisol compared to uh, the other group. Finally, this has been shown to um, improve immune responses in response to stress. So same basic, basic uh, uh, layout as the last figure, but here we see um, really significant reduction or increases in immune responses. So people who have undergone mind-body training um, have increased immunoglobulin responses and as a result what we get is um, these people are less likely to get sick after stress. So those of you who have high stress situations going on, high stress jobs, or you're getting into finals week and you want to think about um, not getting sick from all that stress, some integrated mind-body therapy or um, some mindfulness training might actually be pretty good for that. So I highly recommend it. We're going to finish off um, discussion of some different drugs and how they affect attention. We'll start with nicotine, and I talk about nicotine just because this is an area that I've done some research. <coughs> some research I did with Elliot Hirschman, um, we observed that nicotine withdrawal was associated with reductions in vigilance tasks, so uh, an inability to sustain attention over time. Um, a related study that came out a number of years later showed that nicotine improved both stroop performance but reduced orienting uh, on the intentional network task. In this case, people were given nicotine and their stroop performance increased, um, but they actually had worse spatial orienting uh, on the intentional network task. So nicotine does have um, effects on attention and certainly one of the most common complaints of people who are trying to quit smoking is that they have difficult sustaining their attention. Modafinil is a drug that um, was actually designed as an anti-narcolepsy drug um, but it has become what we call nerd steroids. People are actually taking it in order to improve their functioning and it has been being used to treat adult attention deficit disorder. Um, what we see is improved attentional control via prefrontal networks. Uh, this actually results in increased fluid intelligence and working memory capacity, which we'll talk about in future lectures. Um, in some important studies um, for treating methamphetamine users, one problem that methamphetamine users have um, in their recovery is difficulty with executive function and attention, and modafinil uh, improved that functioning in those recovered methamphetamine users. Adderall and Ritalin are used to treat uh, ADD, ADHD, and it improves those symptoms by increasing executive control. And this is primarily due to their dopamine and norepinephrine enhancing effects. We'll finish out this discussion of um, drugs and attention by looking at marijuana. Um, and we see chronic use in adolescence uh, is associated with more errors in executive control. 
What's interesting about this is that functional magnetic resonance imaging shows increased activation in prefrontal cortex for users of marijuana. And what this shows is that users had less efficient executive control networks. So if we take a look at some of this data, uh, it's a little difficult to see in here, but this is the difference between the users and the non-users. And you can see a uh, pretty significant increased frontal activation. And we believe that is due to, um, sorry, here, this is a parietal, temporal parietal junction, dorsal pathway areas. Um, and so you can see these um, executive control networks uh, were less efficient because they were um, bringing forth more uh, information. Sorry, the prefrontal cortex was actually getting used more, although um, they were making more errors. So something to think about with uh, marijuana in adolescence, for sure. We certainly um, need to probably do some more research in this area as uh, marijuana becomes uh, legal in more places. Um, with that, we reached the end of our discussions of um, Attention, there's some uh, summaries from Marie Banich's book on hemispatial neglect, really terrific cognitive neuro uh, book. Uh, some suggested readings on some of these topics we've talked about in the last couple of lectures. And then finally, some uh, key terms and concepts to think about. All right, well, thank you very much. This is the end of our discussions of attention. I hope you found it interesting. And we'll be back in our next module to talk about um, short-term and working memory.